So today I'm joined by none other than Robert Stromberg, the well-noted production designer on Avatar, Alice in Wonderland, Oz the Great and Powerful, and now with his uh, directing debut on Disney's Maleficent in 2014. Hi, Robert. How are you? <laughs> Thanks for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. You have one of the most unique career paths I've ever seen in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Going from special yeah. effects, you started in special effects, to production design, and then directing. Was that your master plan all along, to end up in directing? No, it, 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 it's, um, you know, I'm as baffled as you are, really. <laughs> uh, my eyes really show that path, you know. But, but uh, no, I, when I started, I, I just came to Hollywood as, um, with uh, the idea of doing something creative, you know. And way back then, it was, that meant getting into special effects. And I used to do what were called matte paintings, which were making environments painted, photo real painting and all that stuff. And, you know, I thought that's about as high as you can go and started doing that and they actually paid me money for that and that was great. And that sort of led into meeting people, it led into visual effects supervising and then all of a sudden I was traveling around and I was a visual effects supervisor and um, that somehow led, actually I'll tell you how, it, it, you know, I, I was a visual effects supervisor on a, uh, uh, on a, film called Master and Commander with, uh, directed by Peter Weir and we became such great friends and he said you know what you're not really doing that anymore you're doing so much designing as well and so we sort of made up this thing called um, Visual Effects Designer and that led to uh, meeting Jim Cameron and then becoming a production designer. Well yeah your first gig the Oscar uh, that's amazing. <laughs> uh, well, I was I was one of the most shocked people in the room. <laughs> you know that that project was um, you know four and a half years of my life, and you know when I first met Jim, it was it was uh, there's it, we started at zero, so there wasn't it, it was it was a complete journey, you know from the first alien plant that was designed to winning the Oscar, there was four and a half years in between, and uh, it was certainly a, a a journey that I won't soon forget. Well, you know, they're starting to leak more and more uh, special effects reels online for the general public to see. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming really clear that live action film sets are almost entirely digital. How is that changing the job of production design? You know, I think uh, uh, today's production designers, they have to, uh, if, they have to adapt. And you, you still have the traditional set of skills that you have to deal with building physical things with set designers and illustrators and craftsmen that do those things, but you also have to have your other eye on um, the budget, which sometimes means knowing how much to build or how much later will become digital. So then that means that you now have to have another knowledge, and that is the knowledge of uh, set extension and visual effects. And I think um, it's just, it's, it's sort of, we've evolved into a place where it's just another set of tools that you need to have as a production designer, I don't think it changes anything else though. So. Well, do you say that transition in the way films are made is what enabled you to make the jump? Or you think you would have made the jump anyway? No, absolutely. It's, it's, it's why. Because what happens is, is that you're not only designing physical sets, but you're designing uh, 3D digital sets. So you, it, the, you're still designing no matter what medium you're, you're using. So. It came along at the right time where we were creating these vast digital sets and that really sort of fell into the criteria of design, production designing. And it's sort of a new thing and there's a lot of talk about that. But I think uh, the bottom line is that it's not going away. So we, we all have to, uh, uh, as designers, um, just understand m more information than we used to. Speaking of you know, vision and design, when you have a digital design, you can do anything, literally. Is that very freeing, or uh, is it like a lot, it's, you have to like well, push stuff out? <laughs> well, I've been very lucky because the, the wallets are pretty thick, you know, but uh, um, not everybody has that opportunity. These things all come at a cost, and um, um, so it, it, you, you can spend a lot of money. These things are very expensive. And so it's really to everybody's advantage that you have, that you don't, uh, that you don't approach it as a uh, a place to experiment. You have to approach it as a um, as a solid plan and follow through. 
uh, and just for financial reasons. So you've had three tremendously successful jobs as a production designer uh, where the films were very visually heavy, you know, and that was a big component. So how did you move into directing? How did, how did you make that leap? Well, you know, uh, over the years, you've been around so many directors and made so many friends uh, who are directors and producers. And, you know, it's, it's, it's like wine, you know, it sort of, <laughs> it sort of perfects over time. And, 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 and uh, uh, it's, it's those people that you meet and, and um, cultivate a relationship with and get and get the, the the trust that you need that you need to to, to take that leap. The uh, the directing is um, for me. It's been uh, actually fairly natural because you know I always look at things as this sort of great canvas, and um, I always feel like things are related, like uh, a composition in a piece of art, or music, or dialogue. It's all a, a rhythm, and it's an understanding of those rhythms that uh, make you able to direct. Any surprises sitting in the director's chair that you didn't anticipate? Oh, plenty, but not <laughs> this discussion. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. We'll let you save those for uh, when Maleficent comes yeah, out. Yeah, no, no. It, it's, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, you're in charge of a very big ship. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there are icebergs. Well, also, you know, Sleeping Beauty, the original Disney Sleeping Beauty, was very style, stylized on yeah. the work with Ivan Durrell. Can yeah, you talk yeah. about if, if you built on that at all? Did you incorporate that all into the look? Um, I can't really talk about <laughs> it, but I, I, you know, obviously is a big fan of uh, Ivan Durrell. I actually have uh, um, some original illustrations, and uh, I think what, we're, what we've tried to do is, throughout this process, um, balance things uh, with not only... Uh, something that people will will give a hint of those things, mm -hmm. but not overpower the film that, that that we're trying to make. And also, Maleficent, you're you're new to directing, but also you have a lot of people coming over from animation. Uh, Linda Wolverton, who wrote Beauty and the Beast, Paul Dini's mm -hmm. making his live action debut, and your producer Don Hahn is a huge and a Disney uh, legend in producing. Yeah. Uh, so when you think of all the, the coming from that animation world and you're from the digital world, how do you think, what kind of effect is that having on live action filmmaking for you guys? Well, we're, we're very much making a live action film. Um, I think with those elements and those people involved, you, 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 you automatically bring in elements that feel more like those sort of classic animated fairy tales and things. So you're, you, you, you bring in a pool of uh, ideas and people and people of experience and you sort through that and um, what you what you hope for it, what, uh, at the end of the day is that uh, you have something that the Disney fans will respect and uh, and enjoy. And the last thing I wanted to ask you is that you know there's a big conversation right now about how the special effects community is being treated by the studios. Uh, and someone even suggested, well, why isn't a special effects supervisor, why doesn't their name go in the opening credit sequence as well, you know, along with, uh, you know, uh, how do you feel about that? Well, I think more and more you do see visual effects supervisors in the credits. Um, um, I, I know on most of the top visual effects films, they are usually in the front credits. Mm -hmm. But um, the things that we were talking about before, I feel that visual effects need to... Uh, I think get more credit for uh, the amount of entertainment value in that. I think that visual effects have actually become uh, essentially a character in the movie oh, like and should be treated as, as importantly as that. Um, so I, coming biasedly from visual effects, <laughs> support my, my friends that do that. And, uh, but I do honestly believe that they, uh, they do... Uh, they do figure into the box office. They do figure into why people want to see films. So they have to be taken seriously. 